The Phantom Hag The flickering candlelight cast long shadows across the faces of the assembled guests, their hushed whispers punctuated by the crackling of the fire. In the grand old castle the conversation had turned, as it often did on these chilly evenings, to the subject of apparitions. Each guest had a tale to tell, each more terrifying than the last, drawing the young ladies closer together in a circle of shared fear. Have you ever encountered a ghost yourself? They asked me, their eyes wide with curiosity and a hint of anticipation. Surely you have a story to tell, something to send shivers down our spines. Do enlighten us. I am happy to oblige, I replied, a faint smile playing on my lips. I have a tale, one that still haunts me to this day. It was the autumn of 1858, and I was visiting my dear friend Albert, the sub-prefect of a small town nestled in the heart of France. We had been inseparable in our youth, and I had even witnessed his wedding to the most charming and gracious woman imaginable. He was eager to show me his idyllic home and introduce me to his two delightful daughters. My stay was a whirlwind of hospitality and warmth. Within days, I had explored every nook and cranny of the town, from its ancient castles and crumbling ruins to its hidden curiosities. Each afternoon, around the hour of four, Albert would order the Phaeton, and we would embark on leisurely drives, returning home as the sun began its descent. It was during one such outing that he announced, Tomorrow, we'll venture further than usual. I want to take you to the Black Rocks. They're remarkable ancient druidical stones, situated on a desolate plain. You'll be fascinated by them. My wife has never seen them, so we'll bring her along. The following day, we set out as planned. Albert's wife sat beside him, while I occupied the back seat alone. The air was heavy with a gray, melancholic mood that mirrored the bleakness of the landscape. As we approached the black rocks, the sun was setting, casting long, ominous shadows across the barren plain. We alighted from the Phaeton, leaving Albert to tend to the horses. We walked for some time across the windswept fields, the towering ancient stones of the Druidic altar looming before us. Albert's wife expressed a desire to climb to the summit, and I offered my assistance. I still recall the image of her graceful figure, draped in a crimson shawl, her veil swirling around her like a crimson cloud as she reached the top. It's truly magnificent, she remarked, her voice tinged with a hint of melancholy. But doesn't it fill you with a sense of foreboding? she asked, her hand outstretched towards the darkening horizon, barely illuminated by the fading rays of the sun. The wind whipped around us, whistling through the stunted trees that dotted the landscape. We were utterly alone, not a single dwelling or human soul in sight. With a sense of unease, we hastened our descent and made our way back to the carriage. We must hurry, urged Albert, his tone growing anxious. The sky is turning ominous, and we'll barely have time to reach home before nightfall. We wrapped Albert's wife in warm robes, her veil concealing her face as the horses set off at a brisk trot. Darkness was closing in, and the landscape grew even more desolate. Clumps of fir trees and stunted bushes offered the only semblance of vegetation. The cold bit at us as the wind howled, the only sounds being the steady rhythm of the horse's hooves and the sharp tinkling of their bells. Suddenly, I felt a heavy hand clamp down on my shoulder. I spun around, my heart pounding in my chest. A horrifying apparition confronted me. In the empty space beside me, there sat a grotesque woman her features contorted in an expression of malevolent glee. I tried to scream, but the phantom pressed its fingers to my lips, silencing me. No sound escaped my throat. Her body was draped in white linen, her head obscured by a cowl, her face ashen and gaunt, 
her eyes replaced by two hollow black sockets that seemed to pierce through my soul. Frozen with terror, I could only stare. The ghost rose abruptly, leaning towards the young wife, her arms encircling her. She lowered her hideous head as if to plant a kiss upon her forehead. What a wind! cried Madame Albert, turning abruptly towards me, her voice trembling. My veil has torn. As she turned, I felt the same infernal pressure on my shoulder, and the phantom vanished as quickly as it had appeared. I scanned the road, left and right, but there was nothing, not a single object in sight. What a dreadful gale! exclaimed Madame Albert, her voice laced with fear. Did you feel it? I can't explain the terror that gripped me. My veil was torn by the wind, as if by an invisible hand. I'm still trembling. Don't worry, my dear, soothed Albert, his tone reassuring. Wrap yourself up. We'll soon be warm by the fire at home. I'm famished. A cold sweat slicked my forehead, and a shiver ran through my body. My tongue felt glued to the roof of my mouth, robbing me of the ability to speak. A sharp pain shot through my shoulder, the only tangible evidence that I hadn't succumbed to madness. I placed my hand on the aching spot and felt a tear in the cloak I wore. I examined it closely, five distinct holes, the unmistakable marks of the phantom's grip. A wave of nausea washed over me, a suffocating terror that threatened to consume me. For a moment, I thought I would die or lose my mind. It was the most harrowing experience of my life. Eventually, my composure returned, and I felt a desperate urge to tell my friends everything that had transpired. But I hesitated, fearing that my story would frighten Madame Albert, and knowing that Albert wouldn't believe me. As the lights of the town grew brighter, the oppressive terror that had enveloped me began to recede. Upon our arrival home, Madame Albert removed her veil, revealing its tattered state. I hoped that my clothing would be intact, that I could convince myself it had all been an illusion. But no, the fabric was torn in five places, mirroring the exact spots where the phantom's fingers had gripped my shoulder. However, my flesh bore no mark, only a dull, throbbing ache. The next day, I returned to Paris, desperately seeking to banish the memory of that terrifying encounter. Or at least, when the memory did intrude, I forced myself to dismiss it as an hallucination. Just a day after my return, I received a letter from Albert. It was edged in black. A chilling dread washed over me as I opened it, my heart pounding with a premonition of tragedy. His wife had died the day I returned to Paris. The End If you like the story, hit that like button and subscribe for more videos. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Was there anything that surprised you? Who's your favorite character in the story? I can't wait to hear your thoughts.